Now, I know Christ said that he would build his church and the gates of hell would not prevail against it. So, like, my question is, from the LDS perspective, how would that work with the great apostasy? Yeah, so the great apostasy is a is a is a, is a difficult kind of a of a discussion. Um, most most members will tell you the great apostasy is a consequence of the loss of priesthood authority and keys and the reestablishment of priesthood authority and keys. That's a very common uh, argument that's made by Latter Day Saints. I don't disagree with that at all. The way that I look at it, though, I think that that is more of a symptom than the actual root problem. I think the root problem is just that the apostles were claiming to be spoken to by God in a culture and time that rejected that God spoke. Because even amongst the Israelites, they have their scriptures. They spend a lot of time. I mean, so like. Jesus's behavior as analyzed by, so there's a, there's a, a biblical scholar I like a lot. Her name is A.J. Levine. And I don't know if you've ever heard of A.J. Levine. I don't think I have. Yeah. She's, she's a great scholar. She's, she's a Jew. Um, she's very, very attached to her Jewish upbringing, her faith, her, her culture, but she's an excellent New Testament scholar. Now, Somebody might scratch their head and say, why would a Jew be a New Testament scholar? But the reality of it is, is that the New Testament was written by Jews. Yeah. <laughs> you know, what you call Christianity is just another sect of Judaism. So, yeah. yeah. And so some of the best information for what was happening in the first century in Judaism is found in the New Testament texts. They're an excellent historical source. So Israelites will study those texts because they are grounded in a cultural milieu that they would have understood and helps to give them a better understanding of their own culture. So Jesus, if he was anything, was a Jew. He was a rabbi, and he seems to have had some kind of rabbinic training. He seems to have been very familiar with the customs, and he seems to be very, very um, competent as a debater in public. Because he's often portrayed as confounding the ruling class of the Sanhedrin, right? He's a very mm -hmm. effective teacher publicly. But what people often don't don't really contextualize about him, because they're too, especially Christians, because they're too like son of God, he's standing on a mount, or he's in a high place, or he's on a boat teaching, and his resonating power of the spirit is flowing out through him, and, and people are following him. What they don't do is they don't put it back into more of a normal, real-world context and think what he really was, um, from a practical, historical perspective, is he was a very effective teacher who argued publicly with other rabbis, which was very common. Very, very common. These debates that are recorded in John and other passages in the, in the Synoptic Gospels, where Jesus is, is debating with the Pharisees about points of doctrine about the law of Moses, about Corbin in, in Mark and other things where he's criticizing them, those kinds of arguments were very, very common amongst rabbis. They did that all the time. It was just part of their culture. In fact, people probably assembled because that was the equivalent of entertainment back then. Hey, that guy Jesus is debating with the Sanhedrin members again. Some Pharisees are debating Jesus. Let's go listen to the arguments. And they would gather around and be like, hey, yeah, he makes some good points. And if he made really good points, it's not like Jesus' followers felt like they were converting to a new religion. They felt like they were just simply adopting a different interpretation of the scripture, which to them made more sense. But any, any church setting would do that. So you, for example, you indicated that you kind of lean towards one philosophy within the broader scope of your own chosen denomination, right? Uh -huh. There's Arminian and there's there's Reformed theology within those two. And you kind of are more in the middle, but you kind of lean, you know, see what I'm saying? Yeah. But being Reformed or Arminian doesn't make you not a Baptist, right? Yeah. You could still be a Baptist or a Lutheran or whatever and be an Arminian or a, or a or Reformed. And they're not going to ostracize you, but you're going to have healthy debate amongst people who disagree with your specific chosen theology. 
And so that's the same kind of an understanding that Jesus would have had in his worldview is they wouldn't have seen that. So this, this particular scholar, she has, she has a very, very kind of healthy perspective of the new Testament and views Jesus from that perspective. And what's really healthy about viewing it that way is that you can kind of get an understanding of the fact that what he's doing is not so, so out in left field. It's not so contrary. It's not so, so kind of unsettling. And um, so in the, in the scope of a, an apostasy, what he is presenting that's very unusual is that he's saying, God speaks to me. I'm not just interpreting. I am the interpreter. My apostles aren't just, just giving you opinions. They are authoritatively given the ability to inscripturate. So, for example, you see in, in like 1 Peter, uh, uh, yeah, 1 Peter one twenty, right, where Peter kind of identifies that he has some authority. And then later on in the text, he identifies Paul as, uh, I think it's 2 Peter 3.16, where, where he identifies Paul's writings as scripture, like they have the same authority as the scriptures of Israel. So this idea that these men aren't just interpreting the scriptures of Israel, but they are actually authoritatively doing so. And in fact, their own writings are new scripture. That's something that's very rejected by the Israelites of their day. Like who, who commissioned you to, to do that? That's taking it too far. So for me, the rejection of that kind of an, I mean, the best way to kind of phrase it would be an open canon. The rejection of the idea of an open canon, of an ongoing succession of people claiming to have the authority to not only orally teach the understanding of those texts, but also to continue to inscripturate those, that rejection is what caused people to reject the apostles, which resulted in their deaths, and of course the loss of their authority, whatever authority they held, delivered by Christ. So now, the claim is in Matthew 16 that upon this rock I will build my church. The argument there is, is what is the rock? The rock can't be Peter, because Peter is going to die. So Peter can't be the rock. I often hear people say that Peter's the rock. But if, if you look at Matthew 16, what he seems to be intimating or indicating is, is that um, thou art Peter, and upon this rock, just previously, Peter had identified Jesus as the Son of God, not by the voice of flesh and blood, but my Father which is in heaven. So the rock upon which, the, the this rock that Jesus is referring to, in, at least in, in my understanding, in my interpretation of that text, is God speaking to man. That's the only rock upon which a church could be built that would last. Now, the gates of hell prevailing, there's a whole analysis. I don't know if you're familiar with Michael Heiser. He does a whole analysis where he contextualizes. Oh, yeah. I love Michael Heiser. Yeah, he did, he contextualized the gates of Hades and, you know, kind of the gates aren't an, aren't an, uh, an offensive device. They're a defensive device. It's keeping things back. Um, Hades keeps things dead that are dead. So the gates of hell prevailing over a thing would mean that they would, if they died, they would stay dead. That could have reference to the fact that what he's saying about the gates of Hades or death won't prevail against my church. And so that would be consistent with Latter-day Saints claims that there would be a restoration. So if the church, quote, died, it was restored, which would be a resurrection. So the question I always ask people who make that argument is, did, did the gates of Hades prevail against Jesus? And the answer, of course, is no. Simply because he died. No. So... That would be one way that a Latter-day Saint would, at least an informed Latter-day Saint, might respond to that criticism. And I think that that makes sense, not only in the context of Matthew 16, but also in the uh, um, context of what's going on at the time. 
Okay, so yeah, that makes sense from that perspective. I guess as a Protestant, I would see the rock being the confession itself, but you know, Jesus oh, yeah. is the son of God. That that would be how I would interpret that, that that's the rock. See, and I would go back a step and say it's the source of the confession that's the rock. Whereas the Catholic Church would say Peter, so Peter's Peter's authority yeah. Yeah. is the rock because Peter He's vesting authority symbolically in the first pope. Yeah. Yeah. And so I yeah, it's just it's just who who's right. I think I am. I think you are. Right? It's just it's just that. I think that it makes more sense. The confession itself, yeah, but the source of the confession is the more sure rock that God communicates to us specifically to a symbolic peter so basically yeah. what i would say is it's all three it's god communicating the confession to an authorized head that's the rock so all three of us are right in that context yeah and i guess the other thing about the great apostasy to me seems to be because Christ seems to prophesy about the great apostasy in Matthew 24. Because I do, I do believe in a great apostasy. So, no, yeah, I, so just real quick. So I think that the biblical texts are more consistent with apostasies, not necessarily yeah. a great apostasy. I think that, that that term is common in a Latter-day Saint parlance. Um, but yeah, I, I'm curious with respect to a great apostasy. What, what, is, your, what is your understanding? My understanding, I mean, like you said, there have been multiple apostasies, uh, right. but I think they're like the the one that's often prophesied about is more of an end times deal. Um, but just in general, I think apostasy in general, like for example, there's a great um, example of ancient Israel, you know, like Elijah, you know, like he thought he was the only believer left and, mm -hmm. and everyone else was worshiping Baal, but God said he left. 7,000 who hadn't yet bowed the knee to Baal. And then Christ, when he talks about like, there'll be many, you know, many false prophets that rise up and will deceive many. Um, and he even says that the, the deception will be so great that if it were possible, the elect would um, be deceived. To me, that indicates the fact they didn't say all would be deceived, that mm -hmm. many just, it, he just used the phrase many, and the fact that it seems like the elect can't be deceived would indicate that at least throughout church history, there would always be a remnant of believers. Like how, how would you view that explanation? You know, I, I think that that is a, I, 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 I get it and I understand that argument. I think it's an argument from silence. The problem with that is, is a lot of organizations make that claim. Like it's the foundation of a lot of the groups that came out of the restorationist movements in the 19th century. Latter-day Saints often get lumped in with a restorationist movement. Our movement is very different, obviously, because we didn't, we didn't, again, we're not just biblically relying on the Bible alone. We have a completely different claim to a restoration of the New Testament not only the organization and structure of what we think the New Testament church was with apostles, but also additional and ongoing inscripturation and new scripture. So, but others like the Millerites and, you know, the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society and those that came out of those, the, the Seventh-day Adventists, the Jehovah's Witnesses, etc. So those, those groups, they all claim that they're a remnant. Basically, we're the ones that woke up one day and we were part of the original group that the, the you know the the Jehovah's Witnesses call them the secret slaves. <sighs> the problem with that is again, it's an argument from from just kind of. I think it means this. I'm going to make this argument because it is what would be required for me to maintain some kind of a connection, especially from a Protestant perspective, because there's no direct claim to any authority or authorized person that you can make that doesn't overlap with Roman Catholicism or orthodoxy. You can't, you can't get back to the apostolic tradition 
through a direct line of anything without overlapping into either Roman Catholicism or Eastern Orthodoxy, right? You're stuck yeah. there. And so <clears throat> ultimately you have to admit you're a break off. Now you can say, no, no, this is a different group and you know, whatever in history, but there's no, at least not to my knowledge, there's no specific claim historically you can make as to who they were identifying them specifically you just have to make kind of a generalized it was this person maybe this person was part of that group etc yeah like i guess how i would view it is because i you know even though i have certain theological leanings i think nobody nobody knows 100 percent. like nobody has the truth 100 percent um would be my no, no. I'm gonna push back on it real quick. I'll explain why, okay. and you're gonna you're gonna agree with me as soon as I do. Okay. Nobody has all truth, but certain people accept truth once it's revealed, and others can't. Yeah. So our there. open canon and belief in ongoing apostolic and prophetic revelation means we can accept new truths as they're revealed. We can incorporate new scientific truths by using a revelatory framework into which to incorporate them into our theology. Our theology can be adopted to correspond with whatever revelations or whatever new discoveries are made by humans or are revealed to us by God. So one of the ways that I often look at the LDS Church is it is true, not simply because it makes correct theological claims, but it is a repository for all truth. So if we often say, you know, bring whatever truth you have and we will give you more. Or if there is truth, we want it. We want all truth. And so we're very like people often ask me, do you accept the Apocrypha as scripture? Yes. Do you believe the Quran is scripture? Yes. Do you believe that the Talmud, all the all these other writings, do you believe the scripture? Yes. Do you believe they're inspired? Yes. See, our our ability to accept truth and that there is truth woven into all these sources and that it can be discerned through the Holy Spirit is a primary theme of LDS conceptualizations of God. We believe that God is no respecter of persons, that he can work through all people at any time. And he does so. There are good, faithful, well-meaning, devout people that have existed in every faith, in every time, in every tradition, into which God has revealed truth insofar as that individual would accept it. People are limited by their presuppositions and their bias, certainly, but they can still accept whatever truth God will give them, and they certainly have truth. That doesn't mean everything that they say is true but they have truth and Latter-day Saints want to incorporate it. It is that claim that makes it true. You see what I mean? I think so. Let's see. So basically if I had a big bucket that says, that said truth on it and you could just pour truth into it, or I had a bucket that said truth on it, that had a lid on it, which bucket's true? Uh, with the lid or the bucket that you can still put truth into. You see what I'm getting at? I think so. I mean, see. The, the person who puts the lid on their bucket isn't true anymore. That's true because new information can come to light. Right. So as soon as you say, for example, that's why I really struggle with the Protestant doctrine of Sola Scriptura. The Bible alone. It can't be true because you're rejecting possibilities. Well, I mean, not possibilities, would, but probabilities. I would say it's not. I would uh, again. You get different, different, different Protestants, but I wouldn't say that the Bible is the only authority for truth. Like I, I would reject that. I think it is, in a sense, for spiritual truth. I think it is the ultimate authority. But I think science, you know, like I, I like the saying, "God is two books: the book of the the Bible and." um book of nature you know like so i think there's different avenues i think the bible is is one source of truth and it is supreme for 
doctrine and everything in my view needs to align with it in the sense of spiritual you know how we live our, our spiritual lives as far as like doctrine and uh morality and, and things like that um but i don't you know i think there's different avenues like science is one avenue so oh certainly yeah yeah and, and that's well it's why it's why our church funds universities because we believe that the academic pursuit of geology science biology medicine law etc but those are also fields of study that can present human minds with the truth those are ways of discovering truth that god has given us right so i i totally agree with what you just said yeah absolutely what i don't agree with is that the bible is one book that is of the other kind of truth the spiritual truth can be found exclusively in the bible and i don't think that you necessarily mean that because obviously as a no. christian you believe that you're you you you're indwelt by the holy spirit and it leads you to truth as well, right? It's how you discern truth. But if I felt, I guess this is, this is where I would say it reigns supreme. If for some reason I had a dream, let's say, that said, you know, you should just leave your wife and child, you know, and I, it seemed really real to me. And it seems just profoundly spiritual that I should make this decision just to, you know, walk off and leave my family. Uh, scripture would say that's wrong you know like so i i would judge scripture and uh, hold that in high regard to any kind of personal revelation or what seemed to be personal revelation you right and, 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 yeah and i appreciate that but i would i would go a step further and i would say the source of scripture still remains god so for me in that same scenario let's say that i had an inclination that I should abandon my wife and children and go off with some other girl. Well, ultimately, the source of that desire is not God. That source, and I would actually, I would actually be at conflict, and I would feel dissonance in feeling that way, and I would have to quiet the dissonance by rejecting the voice of the spirit that's probably telling me, "What the hell are you thinking?" I mean, that's, yeah, yeah, that's totally contrary. Because that's actually going to lead to misery, not only for yourself, but to the, in the lives of your, I mean, it's going to cause suffering if I leave my family to, to go after, I mean, I have momentary pleasure of, you know, maybe dating some younger woman or something, but that's going to be, that's going to pale in comparison to the suffering that I'm going to cause myself and them in the long run. But see, that, that to me is a consequence of God's revealing to me in the moment and my reliance on him as the ultimate authority. I wouldn't need to appeal to scripture to, to know that one way or the other. Now, with respect to like, what's the nature of God? Certainly I, I would appeal to scripture in that respect, but even so arguments would persist with the interpretations of scripture with respect to a, a concept like Christology or, you know, theodicy or some other branch of theology where we're trying to discover how things really are. Um, people are going to be left deciphering and interpreting the biblical text however they do based on whatever methods they do that. But ultimately, even the interpretation of the Bible needs to be left to God. And the way in which God has historically interpreted scripture is through a living oracle, which is what I see in the biblical text. The biblical text actually are the evidence that that's his method and process of doing so. So ultimately, it's a, it's a, a dual method of ancient inscripturation coupled with modern oracles interpreting that scripture. I can interpret the scripture for myself, certainly, but I am not in a position to authoritatively interpret the scripture. And that's where I think that LDS church completely differs from a Protestant perspective on that, because there is no living Protestant church or denomination, or even, even within the, uh, well, that, that would claim that they have the authority to correctly interpret the scriptures, which is why there are so many denominations. Everybody yeah. buys for just ours makes more sense and people bounce between denominations based on how much information they kind of digest. And then they find that this argument makes better sense than that argument. Whereas the, in Roman Catholicism, I would agree with their, at least their one claim that the Holy Church has the unique authority to interpret scriptures and all the members need to fall in line 
if their own individual interpretations differ from the church. But see, the problem I have with Roman Catholicism is they're not claiming a divine revelation to do that. No. So. I, don't, I don't know. You just see all kinds of interesting developments in the Roman Catholic Church. Yeah. You know, so just, I think just historically. Yeah, where where the claim to a living prophet becomes complicated is people's understanding of what that really means. And and the problem with that is, is that people forget that once called by God as an oracle to serve him as an apostle, as one who is sent in advance, or as a prophet who's a spokesperson. Once you're fulfilling one of those two roles as either a somebody who prepares the way, which is why we call them apostles today, because they're preparing on the way for the second coming of Christ, or a prophet who is acting as a spoke, spokesman for the God of Israel. So in those contexts, those, those roles are filled not by somebody whose mind and will is being overridden by God, but by a flawed fallible person who is communicating in a way they're trying to take the revelations and the voice of god to them and communicate that to the people in the best way that they're able unfortunately that is a hindrance to god's ability to communicate because he does filter his language through humans and that yeah. creates that creates a need for that process to continue because moses might say something stupid and then he teaches something that makes some sense. And then Joshua comes along and says, why are you guys doing that? And they're like, oh, yeah, Moses told us to do that. And he's like, what? And he's like, yeah, yeah, Moses was very clear. And Moses and Joshua could say, yeah, stop doing that. That's not, that doesn't make sense. Stop doing that. That's actually detrimental to our group. So don't do that anymore. So, and I'm sure stuff like that happened on a day-to-day -day basis where people appealed to Joshua or or subsequent prophets and leaders of the Israelite nation for clarity on what they should be doing. And they didn't just go back to a text and say, well, it says here, and then argue with the leader of the Israelites or their prophet and say, no, it says here, let's have a debate on it. That's what caused the situation that existed at the time when Christ was born is they had, re they had stopped relying on a living oracle speaking for God. And when one of them did present themselves, they killed them. Yeah. So didn't the the rabbis think that they had like the oral Torah? Like they had they had handed down a oral tradition from Moses that kind of helped them decipher different laws. But again, now you're deciphering an oral tradition or your decide whether it's a written tradition or an oral tradition, you still have subsequent people interpreting it. And obviously there is dis disagreement amongst those people because they are not claiming that God is revealing to them what they should be doing in the moment. What what a Latter day Saint would ultimately claim is take all of the documents and throw them in the fire. God can lead his people through a prophet. He doesn't have yeah. to preserve old documents. He doesn't have to preserve scripture. He doesn't have to preserve what he told Moses to any specific group or people. That they have done that is a good thing, and we can build on that, and that's great. That's what has, I mean, it was the existence of the Bible that I believe inspired Joseph Smith to, one, care about God, to believe in Jesus Christ, and to, and to go out and inquire of the Lord which church he should join. I believe that the Bible set that stage and was the framework into which he even desired to have that communication and relationship. And that's, that's its function. But to believe that it ultimately tells us everything we need to know at any given time, I, I think is, I think is a believing that the texts can do more than they're able. So one of the, one of our apostles, um, elder or Jeffrey R. Holland, years ago gave a talk about my words never cease it's a really good talk if you ever want to read a really good talk it kind of explains our understanding of the biblical text it's called my words never cease by jeffrey r holland i think it's got to be 10 or 12 years old at least it may be even in like a 2008 or 9 talk mm -hmm. but in that talk 
what he does is he identifies the biblical text as having a prominent place in LDS thought. It's first in our canon. We love and revere the Bible. Um, obviously, it contains a record of the ministry of Christ during his life. It contains the writings of Paul. Historically, I, I agree with many historians who say Paul was basically the one who established Christianity from a historical perspective because he's the he's the one who received it from Christ and he started the church amongst the Gentiles and he's the one that really developed a lot of the theology that Christians claim um, comes from Romans and Galatians and Ephesians and all those texts, right? Paul's mm -hmm. really kind of the architect of what people know as modern Christianity. And so I, I agree with that. Without those texts, we wouldn't have a framework into which we could build. But ultimately, the purpose of the scriptures is to bring us into a relationship with God that thereafter points us back to the source of scripture for the answers to what's going on, what are we supposed to be understanding. And ultimately, the pattern that's outlined in those texts is to be led by a living oracle, namely a prophet or apostle. I, I don't know how you get away from that and and ultimately say, well, we can rely on scholarship because that's that's ultimately the argument of most people. In fact, that was really interesting about that discussion I told you about with that guy that believed in the King James only Bible, which I've had lots of those, but this one was particularly interesting, is he could not wrap his head around the fact that he was relying not on the King James Bible, but he was relying on modern scholars who have told him things. I'm like, yeah. you're not actually relying on the Bible. You're relying on scholars who have told you things and who have told you that other scholars did things. And you believe those scholars were really smart and they were really good because they were supremely smart. And I said, at no point in that explanation have you identified the Holy Spirit, God working in it. And he's like, well, obviously it means that. And I said, but that is a claim that they are not making themselves. King James didn't go and say, who's the most spiritual guys? Who are the ones who believe that God communicates through them? Well, none of them are believing that necessarily. He just went and got the smartest, most competent academics. Yeah, and, and assembled them. Now that they were Christians and had a firm belief in Christ, certainly, but they're not claiming prophetic, a uh, prophetic mantle in communicating the scriptures, and and he wasn't claiming that they were. Yeah, but I it, guess how. I guess I would point to several things, like Jesus when he was would argue with the Pharisee, he would constantly point to scripture. And it's interesting because he pointed to his interpretation of the scriptures. Yeah, yeah. Which I would think, as the son of God, he would have the correct interpretation. You would presuppose uh, that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he, it's interesting because he said. But he, certainly he's not claiming the scriptures are authoritative over himself. No, no. I mean, think of the, the Sabbath. He said he was the Lord of the Sabbath. So, right, I yeah. Mean, like, it, because the, honestly, we all just kind of summarily dismissed that he was constantly breaking the rules. Yeah. And then just interpreting it in a way that allowed him to do so. Yeah. But he did. It's interesting because he did when he rebuked them or beginning of his rebuke, when he was telling his disciples, he was like, listen to these guys. They sit in Moses seat. So they had, they had some kind of spiritual authority, but he's like, but don't do what they do. Mm -hmm. Um, but well, John, he, John even has an account of um, uh, Caiaphas actually prophesying that Jesus would die for the Israelites. Yeah. And he's doing so under the authority and mantle of Moses and Aaron because he sits in Aaron's seat. Yeah. And so he, as, he has the authority to receive revelation and does receive it as a consequence of that. And as a consequence of that vested authority that he has, even though he's an unrighteous man who is rejecting his Messiah, is still authorized to receive that revelatory um, information. The, the difficulty with it is, is he's not 
cognizant of that kind of an understanding. And Jesus is struggling with them as a result of that. They are focused too much on their scholarly understanding of things, and they're not listening to the inspiration of God that they have a right to receive. Yeah, but it does seem Jesus really hammers in on, you know, that pretty much all the Psalms, the prophets, you know, they speak of him and just constantly, and then like the the oral tour, the oral tradition that they did have that contradicted the scriptures, he pointed out, your tradition is contradicting what Moses wrote. Mm -hmm. So to me, that seems that he, Jesus does place the scripture on a higher level than spiritual authority and shows that spiritual authority can be deeply, deeply flawed in error. So I guess that's where, as a Protestant, I would, I place my hope in that and my faith in that scripture is a higher authority than, you know, because I do, I do believe that people have spiritual authority. I think a pastor of a church has spiritual mm -hmm. authority. They can err. They can have really wrong doctrine. Right. They still have authority. But I think scripture reigns supreme. And you're right. I, I think people can people can make the Bible say all sorts of crazy things. Like I can make the Bible say weed is smoking weed is good just by saying God created the grass, you know, all that God created is good. Therefore, you know, I should be able to smoke smoke a joint if i want to you know well, like I, people people use it to you know they used to support all kinds of causes that are popular in society today right yeah. the the difficulty that i have with that that understanding is this at no point is jesus going to if you were to sit christ down and asking what's the authority you or the biblical text he would say he is the writer of the biblical text i am the source yeah Right. I'm I spoke to Moses. Yeah. Um before Abraham was, I am, right? So he's he is not vesting ultimate authority in the scriptures of Israel. He he can't be. Certainly as a rabbi, he would be speaking to them in their own language according to their understanding, and he would be making arguments that they would understand, which would include arguing from the scriptures, certainly. But he is also revealing to his apostles and to his and to those who are following him far more than what's in the scriptures of Israel. In fact, he is referencing things that are not in the scriptures of Israel as though everybody just knows them. And and one clear example is when he talks about Abraham seeing my day. There's no reference of Abraham seeing Jesus in the Hebrew scriptures. No. Right? Moses saw me. Moses would have recognized me there's no reference to any of that in the hebrew scriptures so then the other issue is is even those words of jesus don't exist until decades after his crucifixion they may have had an oral tradition that survived but they weren't inscripturated you know i mean the earliest gospel mark is believed to have been penned sometime either in the mid 60s or maybe as late as 70. Um, yeah. I have a friend who who dates it to the early 60s, but that's still three decades after Jesus's crucifixion. So again, it is through the oral ministration of his servants that Christ's new gospel, his new covenant is being established, not through the reliance on old texts. People often point to you know the bereans in Acts 17 and about how they were more noble-minded and, and that's evidence that the scripture is the source which from which we check whatever we're being taught we go back and we check it against the scriptures because the, the scriptures are the authority and I, I i find that puzzling because as paul came to berea and he found these noble-minded jews and that they would check what he taught them against the scriptures I often ask, what exactly is he teaching them, and what exactly are they testing against what scriptures? Paul is teaching them that Jesus is the Messiah found in Isaiah. He's yeah. the, and he's telling them that Isaiah, you know, nine and fifty-three, etc., are references to the suffering servant who is 
the Christ who was crucified by the Rome, right? There's none yeah. of that information in there. That's just Paul's interpretation. But Paul's interpretation is authoritative over theirs. You see what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I, I see. But it seems like they weren't just, I think the point of that is just they just weren't taking Paul at his word. They were actually saying, okay, you're making a claim. Now let's see if your claim is actually substantiated in the but text. His, but his claim can't be substantiated in the text. That's what, That's my point is you can't go back to Isaiah and read the texts that are considered messianic and find a suffering servant and specifically say, these are Jesus of Nazareth. That connection between those, I mean, that's why, why Christians have an understanding of the scriptures of Israel as having a dual nature to their prophetic meaning. Because obviously there are passages like in 53, which probably a reference to Hezekiah. And so these are these are passages that are interpreted but have a fulfillment in some other event that predates Jesus of Nazareth. So it would be just as valid for the Bereans, who are noble-minded Jews, to have just argued with Paul and said, your understanding, your interpretation is wrong. Like, you're, you're just completely off in left field. This has nothing to do with a suffering servant. And you can see that play out specifically in Matthew 16 with the event of like Peter, when Jesus says, I'm going to go die in Jerusalem, Peter says, no. And he says, get, get behind me, adversary, right? You're, you're yeah. trying to oppose the work. Because again, even up to that point, the apostles don't get it. They are still hoping that at some point Jesus is going to like, I mean, we have the Mount of Transfiguration. That must have given them some kind of internal hope that Jesus has glory, that he can manifest in glory, and he's going to like shed his mortal cloak and ride in on a chariot of fire and destroy the enemies of Israel. They're still thinking that. And so, and, and, and late in his ministry, are they still thinking that? The, the interpretations that they have of the scriptures are so grounded into their head, they're not fully comprehending what Jesus is even teaching. And the problem with it is, is that that is not clear in the Hebrew scriptures. It's not there. That's why, um, like rabbis, rabbinic um, interpretations, even in our modern times, laugh at the way Christians read the Hebrew scriptures. Yeah, there, yeah, there's several there's several rabbis that run YouTube channels and they go through all these messianic things and just laugh like ha ha has specific fulfillment if you just turn the page you idiots if you go back three chapters ha ha you know it's like this is not talking about Jesus of Nazareth and, and they're so confident be and because they're just using a strictly historical method of, of biblical exegesis. And they're just like, you guys are wrong. You're reading your Messiah into these texts, and he's just not there. Yeah, that's and actually so, one of my favorite discussions, actually. It's one of the things that kind of got me into apologetics, actually, was, you know, can just people on the internet like that, like actual conversations with Jewish people and being like, you know, like your understanding of our text is completely rubbish. And then doing some research and different things like that and but yeah the like, fact that, well the fact that christians have to concede in many instances that there's a dual nature to those prophecies is almost a concession to the fact that they're correct I because there is specific uh, fulfillment in some of those contexts that is it's unavoidable right you have to go. you have to concede it oh but it also refers to it this way matthew is doing that repeatedly i mean yeah. matthew seems to have cobbled every I mean, he even like he 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 reaches out and just grabs every damn one of them that he can come and says, "Look, Jesus fulfilled everything, regardless of how it works. He he did it all, right? Every yeah. every statement I can think of that I can put on the lips of Jesus that fulfills anything that I find in the Hebrew Scriptures that I think might have a corollary with the ministry of Jesus of Nazareth. I'm going to do it. I'm going to show that he is the total fulfillment of everything that's spoken of in the Hebrew Scriptures, which is his prerogative to do. But again." Those are his interpretations based on 
his current acceptance of Jesus as the Jewish Messiah, as the fulfillment of those scriptures. That's not that's not a factual, objective argument. That's an interpretation. So now yeah. it comes, who's authoritatively able to do that? And that's when you have to kind of rely on Moses was, Abraham would have been, Isaiah was, Ezekiel is, but who else? And the and the Jews at the time of Christ, the, the, the Sanhedrin, they rejected Jesus as one of those authorized people. They rejected all of his followers as having that authority. But and they also they didn't have authority. authority too, right? So like, how do you square that, but, that they have this authority, the spiritual authority, but they were interpreting scripture wrong. They were... They're, they, they're not, the thing is, is they're not claiming, they're not claiming a revelatory authority. They're using academic, historical, exegetical methods. They're not claiming God is talking to them and he is inscripturating new scriptures and that their subsequent understandings are thereafter part of the scriptures of Israel and are authoritative as are the writings of the prophets. See, they're, they're placing the texts as the ultimate authority and they are just saying that because very similar to the catholic church's claims they're yeah. just claiming as the sanhedrin we are the authorized interpreters we're not claiming god is revealing it to us the way moses did no we're just claiming that we are the ones who sit in moses's seat in the sense that we are authorized to lead the church today and we are using moses's words and we're interpreting them for the people today and we're authorized to do that. That's very similar to Roman Catholicism. So it the, doesn't the, actually have to do with authority. It has to do with God actually. God actually doing it. And then revelation, basically. Yeah. And that is the mind of God. That is the will of God. That is the word of God. And it is on par with the scriptures. It, They're like that. You Here's the Bible. Here's the scriptures. And here's the interpretation from an authorized prophet, whether it's from my own voice or the voice of my servants, it's the same. It, that's how Latter-day Saints would view it. And so now that has several problems practically because some Latter-day Saints are lazy about reading their scriptures because they just think that they can listen to the apostles and do what they say. And that's sufficient. I don't think that's sufficient because I don't think that that provides a broader context for what the apostles are talking about. Because one of the problems I have with General Conference, especially when I talk to a lot of members, is I find that they're not familiar enough with our scriptures to understand fully what the apostles are talking about. Because in many cases, they assume that the people are reading better. Right? Like yeah. Paul. And, and a good example of that, I love Paul's letters because <laughs> Paul never wrote a systematic theology. He just kind of, well, to some degree, he kind of half-assed it. So... Because he's responding to specific issues. Now, yeah. what's great is he's trying to convince Rome, the, the, the converts to, to Christianity in Rome, he's trying to convince them that he is truly converted. And so he does a more robust examination of Adam, Moses, Abraham. I know the scriptures of Israel. I'm really smart. I'm very, very gifted in my understanding of these texts, specifically as they relate to references to our Lord Jesus Christ, right? And while you may remember me as the, as the Saul who was persecuting all of you, I am now Paul, apostle to the Gentiles, and I am truly on your side. Let me explain why, because Christ redeemed me. And so People love love the love the, uh, the the epistle to Rome because it has that. It's a more complex and detailed examination of not only the Hebrew scriptures but also of what's going on contextually with respect to Christian de de developing Christian theology. But it's still not a complete coherent treatise. There's a lot missing from that text. All the other epistles, he's usually responding to specific concerns. And he's assuming and presupposing that those groups that he knows personally, because he has probably established them, 
that they already kind of have the underlying context. So he can just reference things he's previously taught them, like he does in Galatia. You're so far removed from the gospel that I taught you. He doesn't go on and then explain everything that was the gospel that he taught them. And so a lot of us just kind of assume what that may have been based on other writings. But we don't know for sure what exactly it was. And, you know, a, a common Latter-day Saint passage that we we, we cite to, to reinforce and support our belief in baptisms by proxy for the dead in the temple is 1 Corinthians 15, 29. Where he's, you know, talks about else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead? If the dead don't rise, why are they then baptized for the dead? What were they doing? Right? What was this group doing that was called baptizing for the dead? What what was it? Well, they knew, but we don't. And Paul yeah. doesn't explain it. He just makes this throwaway kind of why are we doing this if we don't resurrect? Ha. Huh. You know, why are you doing this thing if, if we don't rise again? But he doesn't really explain what the practice is or, or give us any explanation to it. So in, in consequence of that, Paul's letters are an incomplete treatise. I don't think that if you were to sit Paul alive today and say, Paul, your letters are the authoritative word of God, he would probably laugh. He would probably think that sounds ridiculous. Because he would say, okay, I'm sorry, what are you saying? Because who's the authority, me or my writings? And he says, well, the way I mean, he wrote it. Like, if you're, you know, like, for example, like the, you know, like the Constitution, you know, like that. No, no, the Constitution was written for a specific purpose to be. The document upon which we founded our government, right? Its yeah. purpose was to do that, to be a lasting binding document. But it also had an amendment process. You can yeah. add to it, right? Yeah. It, yeah. It, is an, it is an open canon. You can amend it. You can do what you need to. You can detract. You can subtract. You can add. Have at it. So the founding document itself presupposes an amendment process. Paul, and the way I kind of present this to some people, because I have, I have guys that really, and I really appreciated how respectful you are, and, but I get people who just, like, they won't even read the Book of Mormon. So I, I truly admire you for actually reading the dang thing, because I have people who won't even look at, won't even look at it. And I really appreciate the fact that you read it and walked away saying, I kind of liked it, right? Because it wasn't it wasn't what I thought. Because a lot of people read like I can't read it; it's satanic. I mean, did you yeah. read anything in it that sounded satanic? No. no. the The book from beginning to end testifies that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. He's the the purpose of the text is to prove that Jesus is the 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 um, the eternal God. That that's that's its function. That's what it says in the very beginning of the book is that that's its function, its purpose is to the convincing of Jew and G Gentile that Jesus is the Christ, the eternal God. So the, 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 the idea that it would be the Antichrist or Satanic is, a, is predicated on their understanding that the Bible alone is God's word. So I really have this really aggressive kind of sola scriptura um, discussion with people. And so I've really appreciated your, your, uh, your attitude toward it. It's been quite refreshing. But the idea is that what I kind of proposed to them, as I said, to kind of kind of take them out of it, get them think a little bit more critically, is just so if Paul went back to Galatia after they'd received his letter, because they literally believe God wrote the letter to the Galatians, like literally, Paul was just the pen. In fact, I had a guy says Paul's the pen, and God is using Paul to write it. I said, because that would literally mean the letter is more authoritative than Paul. So if Paul goes to Galatia and the Galatians, let's say that they'd misunderstood something that Paul had written based on his understanding, they could actually argue that Paul is wrong and that their understanding of his letter is correct and that Paul's misunderstanding of his letter is, is error. And that the letter supersedes whatever Paul comes and tells them. In fact, he even claims if somebody teaches you something other than what I've told you, they could actually argue that Paul is an apostate because he's contradicting the letter that he wrote. Yeah. 
And really what he's doing is he's just correcting their misunderstanding of the letter. And I said, that's a real scenario under your worldview. And he's like, well, yeah. And I thought that was just ridiculous that if Paul showed up in person, that he wouldn't have the authority to say, burn the damn letter. You guys didn't understand it, obviously. Let's all sit down and I'll fix the understanding you guys had. But my hell, what are you doing? Like, this is not what I meant. Well, the letter, no, the letter's just a letter. Throw it in the garbage, right? I, I think that that probably is more consistent with what Paul would have done rather than having basically bowed down to the letter as because it was inspired by the Holy Spirit that that translates into God wrote it. And if God wrote it, then Paul would be subordinate to it. And I don't think that that's what anybody would have understood, especially not Paul. Mm, and that's yeah. that's literally what would happen. Because, because even the argument you're making about Jesus appealing to Scripture, taken to its logical conclusion in a rigid sense, Jesus is, sub is subjected to the Scriptures. The Scripture is more authoritative than the Christ. And nobody believes that. No Christian would believe that Jesus is subordinate to Moses' writings. He couldn't be. He He's the source of them. That kind of gets into a complex. Because he's God, but yet he was also human. And then he, he's, See, and I, don't, I don't believe that, so. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's a conversation probably, for another time. Yeah. That's the hypostatic union, believe, and I reject it. <laughs> you probably believe he is the fulfillment of the law, right? Like, you would believe that, right? Like, he's the... So, he is, we can talk about that for a few minutes. I, I've got to go. We, we've been talking yeah, for a while. I, probably I, I, I really, and the reason we've been going, I, I told my wife that I'd only go an hour, but I've really enjoyed this discussion with you. Um, yeah, it's not it. often I find somebody who's conversant and open-minded and not doesn't just want to be a, a jerk and argue with me all the time. Um, so I really appreciate you. Um, so I, I always ask, fulfillment of the law meaning what? There's different ways you could take that. One would be that he he was the uh, basically he lived the perfect life. Like he 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 was sinless. He did everything correct, you know, so that he could be our substitutionary atonement. I guess. Mm -hmm. um, but then there's the fulfillment of the law in the sense of he fulfilled like the prophecies, you know, like the the. He's the one, he's the prophet like Moses, you know, like he, that kind of fulfillment. So there's different ways you could take it. But I guess what I was meaning, the more that he fulfilled the law in the sense that he was sinless. He was the perfect spotless lamb of God. So I'm going to respond to that quick. I'll give you a few minutes to respond to what I say and then um, basically kind of let you have the last word. But so you're right. How do you know what that even means? Because it is something that is claimed, but we don't know exactly. In fact, I always ask, what are you talking about? I get those two, but I also get about 10 other understandings, most of which are predicated on largely on the ignorance of the person. They're just kind of using their own logic to kind of figure it out. The most common one is he eliminated the law of Moses completely by dying on the cross. No more keeping the law of Moses, right? Yeah. And I said, but that doesn't make sense because Acts 10. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah, that doesn't make yeah. sense. So, and they, they don't, it's like, oh, yeah. So it looks like specific provisions of the law of Moses are gradually being abrogated. Plus, you have the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15. Yeah. Where they're arguing about what should we still be doing with respect to like circumcision, etc. Um, then you have issues of what's the role of women in the church. So this idea of who's in charge, who does what, what are we doing, how far, because the law of Moses, and this is another thing, they're like, there was the spiritual side, and then there's kind of more the legalistic side. And in looking at the law, 
you've got obviously he didn't abrogate the Ten Commandments. I always say, did he? So he got rid of the Ten Commandments. And like, well, no, no, not that. Right. You know what I'm saying? So the claim that he died on the cross and we just throw out the law of Moses doesn't make sense either. Jesus kept the law of Moses, but certainly modified it as it was convenient for him to do. So one of the things that I often get asked is, how did Jesus keep the law? And my argument is, is as the source of the law and as God, he can do what he wants because whatever, whatever Jesus did is the correct way of doing things. Therefore, he could not sin because his way, like if he rebuked somebody or yelled at them, he did it the proper way, like the exact perfect way to yell at somebody. That's what Jesus did. So it's not sinful because he did it the way you're supposed to. When he made a whip and cleaned out part of the temple, that's the righteous way to clean out a temple is with a whip the way Jesus did it. So at no point in, in that act could he have sinned because, again, as God, he's doing it the way God would do it. Just like God can command the Israelites to wipe out a civilization and it's not sinful because God is commanding them to do it to fulfill God's purposes, right? So that's kind of my, my logical thinking in that respect. But with respect to specifically fulfillment of the law, there's a lot of broad understanding of it. It's actually one of the questions that it looks like Joseph Smith wrestled with. So when we talk about a restoration in this church, an analysis of the way we are as Mormons is complex because as Mormons, we have an Old Testament practice that has been adopted into a new covenant relationship with Christ because we have taken those components of the Mosaic tradition, which were not um, abrogated through Christ's sacrifice and death, and we have combined them with the consequences of his atonement that followed afterwards by the ministry of his apostles, and we have merged those together into the religion that we believe was practiced by Abraham. So that's what we're doing. And so oftentimes people will look at things like our temple worship. The apostles continue to engage in temple ritual and, in fact, the temple continued to be the center of their focus throughout the New Testament. Paul specifically, and people say, well, we're the new temple because Paul uh, compares us to the temple. But if he didn't view the temple as a source of holiness and as a symbol of purity in his life, he wouldn't be comparing us to the temple as the house of God if he no longer believed that the temple was the house of God. So the temple still has a central place in their ministry. So that's one of the reasons why we believe that those, those ambiguities as to what it means to fulfill the law can only be resolved through an additional revelatory process. We can't just use the biblical text to figure it out because not all of the issues are addressed throughout the New Testament texts. There, there's just not enough there. But it looks like they resolved at least some of these issues. I actually don't believe that they resolved all of them at all. I think that that was an ongoing process that was abruptly discontinued with the death of the apostles and the rejection of their revelation. Now, with respect to a great apostasy that we talked about earlier, I believe that the early church fathers continued in faith and with the authority that was conferred on them by the apostles. But what I think was their mistake is in their absolute humility and their devotion to Christ and their devotion to the apostolic ministry that had preceded them, they undercut their own authority by failing to see their own writings as scripture. Right. So mm -hmm. like Tertullian and um, Justin Martyr, etc., they those guys should have seen their own ministry as apostolic. And they should have said, look, 
I am authoritatively teaching and I, my words, my texts are scripture, the same as Paul and Peter and the gospels are scripture. But instead they subordinated theirs basically and made it commentary rather than authoritative scripture. And that to me was their failing because of a deeply held humility. I, I appreciate that. But they needed to have basically kind of said, look, we have the same authority as Peter. We have the same authority as Paul uh, to, to inscripturate. Now, what they did claim is we have the same authority to minister, to interpret, but not to inscripturate, and certainly not to continue to receive public revelation. I think it was a, a, a knee-jerk reaction to just say, let's grab the apostolic writings and they're authoritative. But even that took centuries to figure that out. But that's kind of my problem with this idea of fulfilling the law of Moses. I don't know what it means. Well, I, I believe I do because I believe that I have modern revelation to kind of clarify a lot of those issues. But I often wonder what other, other people th think. But just a blanket, Jesus obliterated the law of Moses. We don't keep any of it. That's stupid because what that does is that undercuts the usefulness of the Old Testament. But see, you have Messianic Jews who I think kind of understand you don't just throw it out. You have to go through the New Testament and say, well, we don't do this and we don't do that. Yeah. Okay. But how far do you go with that? Well, just as far as what's revealed in the New Testament. Which is why you see Messianic Jews still wearing what looks like Jewish garb and clothing. Yeah. Right? Because they're, they're, they can only go with what the biblical texts have. And they can only go that far. And so I, I, don't, I don't know how they know whether they're supposed to keep doing that or not. Because it's possible that in the ancient church, first century church, they had eliminated a lot of those practices. And people just understood it. Certainly, they're arguing over whether Gentiles need to come in and certainly start wearing, you know, the, the Jewish garb that men were required to wear, fringes and things like that. Were they supposed to be doing that? Head coverings. And there was arguments about that, it looks like, in the church and confusion as to whether or not Gentile converts need to become Jews before they were Gentile converts. And maybe they did and maybe they didn't. So there, yeah. there's a lot of this. There's a lot of this kind of going on and it's not really reconciled fully in the new testament yeah yeah it makes sense yeah like i definitely see what you're saying like i definitely to me it cuts kind of both ways in the sense of yeah i, I see i see the problem with sola scriptura in the sense of you do like if you're you can get all these different interpretations and that results in a bunch of different denominations but then on the other hand the idea of god revealing you know like having this line of prophets that God is revealing things to, you know, that also has problems. <laughs> yeah, that has problems in the sense of one prophet will say this, and then all of a sudden, several prophets later, that gets completely done away with. And Now, in practice, that's not actually what happens. But I, I do get your point. Like, in yeah. the church history, that's not what happens. The idea of somebody teaching something and it being eliminated from our tradition has happened, but it, it's not common. Yeah. Yeah. And the, I think, yeah, from what I understand, LDS history, it's happened a few times, not a whole lot, but yeah. also. And mostly Catholic it has to do with practices. Yeah. And the Catholic tradition, I mean, heretics should be burned versus heretics, you know, like them later apologizing for burning heretics, you know? So, Yeah. I, I think there's like in the case of origin and others where they like dug them back up, and burnt them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I, I, do was funny. I do appreciate you taking the time out of your evening. To no, talk this was to great. Me. It was fun. I appreciate talking to you. The missionaries were correct that you, they said he's a really nice guy and he's really smart. And so it'll be productive. I, I really appreciated it. I, if you want to talk again, let the missionaries know. Okay. Sounds good. Up. Thank you. Thanks Thank a lot, you for your Have time. a good night. You too. You too. All right, bye.